Yeah, to join us today for this webinar, Justine. Um, Justine is a registered psychologist, director of child clinical services and certified grief recovery specialist at the Grief and Trauma Healing Center in Edmonton, Alberta. It's amazing what technology can do. Uh, Justine works with children, teens and adults impacted by grief and trauma. She regularly runs educational and psychotherapy groups and enjoys professional speaking, facilitating debriefs, workshops, consultation and training events, along with contributing to blog posts at the Grief and Trauma Healing Center. So thank you, Justine, for uh, joining us today. And um, the screen is all yours, so to speak. Awesome. Well, okay. thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm just going to pop up and I hope this works on the first time. I think it did. Yeah, Do people kind of that? Nice forest scene. <laughs> I yeah, love the background yeah, so much. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Janik. So as Janik said, you know, I work at, um, I'm a registered psychologist and I work at the Grief and Trauma Healing Center. So I'm all the way in, in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So, you know, I don't know where everybody else is, but I'm sure you're all over Canada. Um, and luckily today in Edmonton, we're sunny, but if you live where I live, we've had a ton of rain and, and I think we're all sick of it at this point. So fingers crossed it stays, uh, stays really nice and beautiful for us. Um, so at the grief and trauma healing center, we obviously specialize in, in grief and trauma as our, our name implies. Um, and our mission really is to come alongside people who are grieving or experiencing a traumatic event and support them. Um, and we do this through groups, um, individual counseling, family counseling, couples counseling. Um, we do all types of therapy approaches um, and, and work with people from all sorts of ages. So um, I see a lot of children, um, but I also see adults as well. Um, and uh, we try to service as many people as we can. So feel free to interact with me in the chat. I, I do my best when I do these presentations to have it open <laughs> off to the side. And I, I don't know if you guys can see that. So I might have to close it if it's getting in the way. Um, but, you know, feel free to send me messages, comments, um, anything like that. And, and I might shout it out or, or comment back on it. Um, and, you know, feel free to use that to engage throughout this presentation. Um, there are going to be some, some questions I have for you guys, and you're welcome to share um, your side of things or, or comments on those things. So uh, please use that. I love when people interact with me here. Um, so we're able to kind of uh, chat with each other as we do this. Okay, so today we're talking about anticipatory grief. Um, and, you know, this is a, an area of grief that I think um, doesn't get a lot of attention. You know, a lot of times we when we're talking about grief, we're, we're talking about the, the aftermath or, or the process that happens after a loss. Um, and, you know, I'm going to chat about some definitions around anticipatory grief, but really what that is, is, is the before. Um, and, you know, I hear it all the time through, you know, my different clients or people I work with when, you know, we go through a loss, sometimes we reflect back and, and we might think, wow, you know, I didn't even realize that, you know, I was already grieving before the loss occurred. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, now, you know, I'm going to dive into grief in general, but, um, you know, the focus of today is going to be how do we cope with anticipatory grief? What are some myths or misinformation around grief? Um, and, you know, what can you do to help yourself or, or somebody else going through it? Okay, there we go. So, it's brief outline, like I said, you know, we're going to jump into some signs and symptoms, um, as well as different forms of losses. Um, that is something I think that is so helpful to know about, because I find a lot of times people don't realize there's there's all types of losses that we can go through um, and all types of losses within a loss, which is kind of a strange occurrence. Um, but that's something that I think can be really helpful to be aware of and, and know, you know, when you might experience anticipatory grief. And then, like I said, at the end, you know, we're going to jump into some coping tools or way to help, we'll help ourselves or other people. Um, and then we are going to have some time here to uh, get into some questions. So Janik's going to kind of help me do that. And, and we're going to jump into some questions um, that hopefully I can, you know, shed some light on for you guys. Okay, so anticipatory grief is, um, you know, like I mentioned, is, is usually before a loss. So I always like to give a definition of grief before we get into the anticipatory part of it. 
Um, and one of my favorite definitions of grief comes from the grief recovery method. And what it implies grief is, is that it's an end or a change in a familiar pattern of behavior. Now, that's kind of a weird way to define grief. I think a lot of times we define grief as, as something that occurs after, especially like a death. That, that's usually where it gets associated. Um, but when we open it up and define it in this way, we're able to realize that grief has so many other ways that it comes up for us. There's so many forms of loss. And really what uh, you know a loss is can be defined by that end or change in that pattern of behavior. Now, anticipatory grief is you know the experience of this expecting a loss or, or expected loss. And that is essentially when we're anticipating the end or the change. And a lot of times we might experience a lot of what ifs or, or you know, what will be next or what's going to happen after this loss occurs. Um, so you'll see when we go into some of the signs and symptoms, um, you know, there is there's a lot of anxiety or fear that can come with anticipatory grief. So that's a bit of around that. And I think this diagram really dives into and, and really demonstrates what it is. Now, anticipatory grief has a lot of similar symptoms to grief. Um, and like I mentioned at the start, I think a lot of times we don't even realize that, that we're experiencing anticipatory grief until afterwards or until the loss occurs. Um, so a lot of times I find it is helpful to know about it. Um, even to kind of clue in and go, hmm, you know, is, is some of what I'm experiencing right now related to this anticipation of, of this loss? Okay. Now, I've kind of hinted at this already, but there's so many forms of, of losses, um, you know, and especially, you know, with this being the Brain Tumor Foundation, you know, many of you might have experienced um, grief and especially anticipatory grief, you know, when we're talking about some sort of serious illness or disease, a lot of times there's a lot of anticipati anticipation about, you know, that loss and, and what's going to happen. Um, so that's a pretty common one where we might experience anticipatory grief. The other ones relate to some stuff that you might not really think about as a loss. So even changes to jobs or, or losing your job. Um, you know, I think especially with COVID, there was a lot of job loss and that can create a lot of fear about our future. Um, but it also might create a lot of anticipation about, you know, our finances or, or what's going to happen. Other types are, are things related to changes in our age. So getting older, um, even our, maybe our children getting older, sometimes that brings about a lot of changes to our health or our body or even our, our ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. Other types include moving um, or even like a birth of a baby. And, and sometimes these are exciting moments in our lives and um, you know they can be filled with joy. Sometimes we're excited to move. Sometimes we're so happy to, to have a baby, um, but they can also have a tint of, of grief associated with them in terms of just what's gonna happen, what's gonna change. Um, even, you know, the changes to our neighborhoods or, you know, the way our house feels um, are, are different forms of losses. The last one I have listed here is, is, you know, times when, you know, maybe our children move out or get older or, you know, our, we're experiencing that empty nest. Um, so sometimes that's a change in, you know, roles that we have or, you know, we have all this free time all of a sudden because we're not raising kiddos um, that can also experience we can experience that anticipation and also, you know, grief at the end of it. Now, I always like to kind of preface this as well with there's so many forms of loss. So, you know, I like to think about it more of, you know, is there some sort of experience or change happening in your life that when you look at what you're experiencing right now, so some of the signs, some of the symptoms, um, you know, is this considered a loss for you? And some people might, um, not think about it as a loss. So, you know, maybe moving is just full of joy, lots of happiness. You actually don't consider that a loss. You know, you're not going to miss your old house or, you know, your old neighborhood. Um, so it's very unique to you. And, and that's a piece that I want you to keep in mind 
around grief is that it's it's so unique and um you know it's okay to have different experiences than other people um through grieving and, and mourning okay so I gave you that little spiel. It's all unique to you around some of the signs and symptoms. Um, but there are some that we, that are pretty common. Um, sometimes we use, especially around the emotions, especially with anticipatory grief. Um, we often experience kind of a roller coaster of emotions or a lot of conflicting emotions. Um, so whether it's yourself or maybe you're working with somebody like, you know, as a healthcare professional or just a family member, um, you know, our emotions can range in so many different ways when we're going through a loss or, or anticipating a loss. Um, and that can range from like sad to mad, to happy, to relieved, to, you know, frustrated, you know, there's so many different emotions that we might experience, um, you know, anticipation to that, to that loss. Um, and, and sometimes they go up and down. So you might be supporting someone and maybe one day, they're in a good mood. They're feeling relatively, you know, at peace with that. And then maybe the next they're really angry about, about this loss. Um, so, you know, that's something that's, that's to be expected. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about some of the coping tools later on here, um, there are some ways just to accept and, and kind of process through those, those feelings. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in that, you know, we don't try to get rid of feelings or emotions. Um, and especially if you're supporting someone, you know, we don't want them to feel like they can't express themselves or that, you know, certain emotions are acceptable or not. Now, we also see a lot of times impacted sleep or eating habits. So, um, you know, sometimes that's eating more or less or sleeping more or less. Um, this is going to be unique to you. Um, at times we can see that, you know, sleep or eating can be a way to try to cope with our feelings. So sometimes you might see someone who has a really hard time getting out of bed or they just want to sleep all day. And a lot of times this is a cue to us that they might be using that to try to deal with their emotions or, or even try to avoid having to even think through, you know, this upcoming loss. As I mentioned, you know, there is a lot of fear and anxiety around the future or the, the loss that's coming up. So that's pretty common. You, you know, you're going to see that, um, you know, I think as adults, we experience that, but especially in kids, you can come, sometimes see that come up where, you know, they might be asking a lot of questions or maybe they're reporting more tummy aches, or they seem to be a little bit more wound up than usual. Um, and that's pretty normal when we're anticipating something big happening in our lives. We also have issues with concentration and focus. And, and this is a huge one I, I hear all the time, you know, my people come in going, I just can't focus at work. I, I can't focus on my work. I'm just thinking about this loss or, or this upcoming loss. Um, and that, and that's very normal. And, and sometimes it's really hard because we might want to keep being able to do kind of our day to day or, or keep doing what we're, we're used to. Um, but it's so important to remember that losses are huge experiences and, and grief is a big, um, you know, event to go through. So sometimes that requires making some space for, for us and, and, you know, giving ourselves a bit of compassion about that. The other thing that I sometimes see people do, and, and I see this in both children and adults, and, and it kind of looks a little bit different compared to, you know, depending on the age. Um, and what this is, is rehearsing the death or, or the loss. So, you know, sometimes this is, you know, in children, you sometimes will see them playing out different experiences. So you might have an upcoming move and, and you might, you know, witness your child um, playing with their, you know, let's say dolls or, or characters and they're playing out a big moving day or, you know, they're playing out their anxiety related to moving. Um, you know, sometimes we see children do this or, or even with their peers, they might play a game of, you know, somebody dies in the game. Um, and that's pretty typical where children are exposing themselves to this upcoming loss um, in a way that, that they're trying to work through that. Now, we do this as adults, you know, we will often even start to imagine what that loss is going to be like or, or what that day is going to be like. Um, so let's say you have someone in your life who, you know, has a terminal illness 
you might rehearse or, or think through, you know, what that day might be like when they, they finally pass away. And um, a lot of times we're doing this to help ourselves desensitize and, and expose ourselves to that experience, which at times can actually be quite healthy. Sometimes we're helping ourselves um, even kind of process through that anxiety and that fear, um, or even prepare ourselves for, you know, that, that big day. Um, other times I find it can, can turn a little bit unhelpful. And, and this is usually where we might be constantly thinking about it. Um, or maybe we are, um, you know, really ruminating or, or, you know, processing through that constantly where it's, it ends up being, um, getting in the way or, or being too much, you know, we're, we're thinking about a little bit too much. So those are just, you know, a handful of some of the symptoms. And, and like I said, you know, they're super unique to you and, and the person who's going through them. Um, and, and one of the things I always keep in mind is, you know, everybody has, is so unique and has their different personalities and temperament and ways of expressing themselves. Um, so that's something that, you know, to keep in mind if you're supporting someone or even for yourself that, you know, there's no right way to show um, anticipatory grief or, or grief in general. Um, and we're often just doing, you know, we're, we're showing or signing symptoms that that fit with our way of processing through emotions. Okay. So one of the huge factors in, in what I do is, is a lot of um, educating people on some of the myths that, that we learn around grief. Um, and, and we end up running into a lot of misinformation around grief and, um, you know, mourning. Um, part of it is, is I think, you know, not a lot of times do we really consider grief until it happens to us. You know, we often are going through life and um, something horrible happens or, or, you know, some big loss, you know, happens and, and we're searching for answers. And at times things can be very comforting or, or might help us through that. Um, but other times they start to create some unhealthy habits or, or thoughts around, you know, how we should be coping with, with grief. So like the symptoms, there is so much information out there both good and bad that, um, you know, you might find other things than, than what's listed on this slide um, that is misinformation. These are um, kind of the six myths that come out of the grief recovery method. And, and I think they do a good job about, you know, trying to encompass a lot of things, but obviously you might have more here. Um, and I encourage you as we're going through this to let me know if there's maybe some information or, or things that you've been told around grief that um, doesn't seem to fit or, or doesn't reflect your experience, um, or maybe you're even curious about. Um, and feel free to use that as a way to ask a question around, is this true? You know, is there is there something that, that you're wondering around grief that, that would make sense? So the first one that, that I think is quite popular and I, I hear a lot is the idea that time heals all wounds. And you know, a lot of times I think this is something that we get told that, you know, it'll just take time, you know, you'll get over it or, you know, the first year is the hardest or some sort of weird kind of timeline, depending on who you talk to around, um, you know, how long it should take to um, kind of essentially get over grief. Um, and Janet just kind of put there that, yeah, you know, grief is not linear. You know, we can't put a timeline on it. And, and I kind of imagine it, you know, reflecting, you know, you can't put a timeline or um, quantify a certain relationship into kind of a box of a time. You know, I think of, you know, my relationships with people, you know, I would think, you know, a year is not enough. You know, a year doesn't encompass all of the memories and these special moments with this person. Um, and, you know, a lot of times what I find grief is, is it's an ongoing process that, that we run into. And part of that is the reflection of just how important that relationship was. Yeah. You know, I have a comment here that says, you know, grieving the loss of yourself. And that's huge. I think when, you know, we look at types of losses, you know, we can also be grieving parts of ourselves or, or things about us that, that are different or that have changed. Right. Yeah. 
Okay, so the second one here, or the second idea here is that um, you just need to keep busy. And, and this one's pretty popular too. And, and this is the idea that, you know, you go through a loss, you know, you're obviously upset about it, you're very emotional, or even before the loss where you're anticipating it. And a lot of times people will even sit down with me in my counseling sessions and they're like, you know what, Justine, I just got to distract myself and just keep pushing ahead. I just got to keep busy. And on one level, it this kind of works, right? It, it kind of prevents us maybe from thinking about the loss or, or the upcoming loss. Um, but what it does is it really distracts us from the emotional experience of this. And, um, you know, in our, our, our section around coping, we're going to talk about some ways to sit with your emotions rather than trying to push them away or distract yourself or get rid of them. Um, you know, I think there is some usefulness in that. Sometimes we do need a bit of a break. Sometimes we just need to sink ourselves into like, you know, really good book or, or work or, or something like that to, uh, you know, kind of take our mind off of things. Right. Yeah. 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 And Haley wrote here that she's also experiencing that who I was before diagnosis and, you know, what my future would look like. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The third one here is this idea that we want to replace the loss. And this one is kind of a, a weird one when you think about it. I, I know when we think about this and related to a, a, a death, you know, we're like, there's no way I could, you know, replace my dad or, or, or somebody significant in my life. Um, but really what this speaks to is this idea that we might hop into something else or try to kind of um, cope with those, those feelings of grief by, um, you know, finding something similar. And sometimes this is even, you know, if I think of like a relationship loss, you might get into another relationship really quickly. Um, or sometimes I run into this a lot of times with pet losses where, you know, the pet dog dies. And, and so, you know, the parents buy another dog really fast because they, you know, the kid's really upset. Um, and a lot of times this stunts our, our own emotional experience about, about the loss and, and doesn't allow us to really honor that that relationship and, and, you know, make space for that loss itself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This fourth one is an idea that we need to be alone to grief. And I find this one sometimes just naturally occurs maybe in your family or, or your group of people, um, with people being uncomfortable with grief. And sometimes what this looks like is, even comments from people about, um, you know, hey, you know, don't bother mom today. She's just really upset about this. And so mom sits in a room by herself for the whole day. Now, this isn't to say that, you know, you can't take time to yourself. You can't take space and, and have a bit of a break from other people. Um, but sometimes what I find is that we might do this or our people around us might encourage this or we might encourage this. We might think like, ooh, don't bother them. We don't want to talk to them. Um, or we don't want to bring up the loss itself. Um, or we sometimes do this ourselves where we might not share our, our loss or our grief or even our an, an anticipatory grief. So we might not voice, you know, some of the, the ways that we're grieving. Um, you know, even in our chat, I, I see several of you commenting, yeah, you know, I, I experienced that loss, that, that strange feeling of, of losing yourself or losing parts of myself and my old life. And that's huge, I think, to share your experience um, and, and help people, you know, not only relate to you, but also, you know, for you to be able to express that and, and get support from other people. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now this fifth one is something that um, I hear for people who are grieving, but also for people who are supporting grievers. And, um, and this is this idea that you have to stay strong or be strong. And sometimes I, I have parents really well-intentioned will sometimes say this to kids where they'll say like, be strong for mom or be strong for dad or whoever. And um, sometimes what this causes is us to 
stop our own emotional experience because we feel like we we need to kind of become this stoic person and in, in being you know strong and, and a symbol of strength um and that is really difficult because what happens is then we're just worried about everybody else or or we're thinking that you know we have to um you know be this kind of rock for everyone and a lot of times what I find is is you know like I mentioned we we don't allow our own emotions to come out or we don't also get support from other people we end up being this kind of rock for someone but you know we can't sink into anybody else or have someone else support us yeah yeah I see some comments here around surgery and you know waking up and and having a uh you know changes happening after surgery that you weren't prepared for or things were very drastically different um you know and almost the weirdly the opposite of anticipatory grief thinking maybe you know what's going to happen and then waking up and it going through that and and being hit with this massive loss that is is different than what you expected yeah i see a comment here on our people saying you are so strong yeah you know i i find that happens a lot for people who are going through um a certain illness or or disease that um you know you're so strong but sometimes that gives us a feeling that, you know, we have to be strong then and we can't show our emotions. We can't grieve. We can't have those conflicting and roller coaster of feelings that come with grief um, because we have to be this strong person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now the sixth one is, is this idea that we shouldn't feel bad. And, and this one kind of sounds insensitive, but I find it's quite sneaky in how it gets put into, uh, into conversations or um, the way it's said. And I find a lot of times it, it's kind of this idea that, you know, you shouldn't feel bad because of this. So some of you might have heard, you know, oh, well, you know, you were just so strong and, you know, you shouldn't feel bad because you survived. Or, you know what, you know, at least you got through surgery and, and you shouldn't be upset about that. You shouldn't, you know, be worried about anything else. You, you're living. And, you know, if you let that hit you, you know, sometimes I find what you realize is, is you're like, ooh, that doesn't really reflect how I might be feeling. You know, I might not feel strong. I might actually feel horrible about, you know, even being alive. Um, and by someone kind of telling you not to feel a certain way, that doesn't feel nice. And, and sometimes that really stops us from even sharing our own emotions because we're, you know, already recognizing this person's assuming or maybe doesn't really want to hear if we feel bad. Um, now, a lot of times those comments are really well-intentioned and people are, are trying to um, help you. So sometimes they, people will say this to try to make you feel better. They'll say like, oh, don't feel bad. Don't be upset about it. Um, when you really, you might be. But a lot of times what I find is that people are trying to make themselves feel like they, they can fix it or, or um, help make you feel better. And what I find with grief and anticipatory grief and changes and, and drastic changes that happen in our life is there are times where there is nothing to be fixed fixed, and we can't fix it. And there's nothing anybody could say to make it better. And that is something that is really hard for people to uh, sit with, you know, whether it's yourself or supporting somebody or someone trying to support you. Um, people really struggle with allowing space for that. Yeah, Karen put a note here that they don't know what else to say. So they try to say something positive. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a note here and, and we'll get to that slide about the difference between gratitude and, and this toxic positivity that just sometimes totally stunts us from our emotions or kind of takes away from, you know, thinking about anything else, you know, and, and you're just supposed to feel good about it or, or find something good in it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I know people have, have already made some comments, but I'd love to see in the chat if you have 
times where people have said stuff like this to you, or maybe times you've thought about it yourself, you know, I'd love to hear it and, and continue that dialogue as we're going through. Okay, so now we're jumping into some of the ways to cope with anticipatory grief. And I really like to, uh, you know, make it known that this stuff works for antis anticipatory grief and also for grief itself. So, you know, don't feel like it only relates to the before. It also relates to the after. Um, and this is stuff that anybody can do. So you could be a kiddo and do this. You can be an adult. You could be a healthcare worker who's maybe trying to support somebody. This is all relevant, um, you know, to, to helping, you know, you experience grief, but also other people. Yeah. Yeah. There's more comments here around, you know, not realizing after surgery, what, what it was like and, and what it was going to be like. And, and some comments around that being disappointing, right. Not knowing what to expect after all of this. Okay. So, you know, when we're talking about emotions, there is a tendency and it's very natural of us to do where we don't like to feel uncomfortable. So even when I think about, you know, if you're sitting in like an uncomfortable position, we will often adjust ourselves. We're trying to get rid of it. We don't want to feel that way. And we often do this with emotions. You know, we don't want to feel them. So we try to push them away or we try to find ways to, you know, distract ourselves enough that, you know, it doesn't come up. And this can work time to time. Like there's some pretty impressive ways we can go about doing this. Um, but I find a lot of times what happens is it's just preventing us from going through the process of feeling the emotion related to the loss. And what it kind of does is delays us from, from really processing that. Um, and, and sometimes we need to do this. There, there are times where we're kind of in survival mode you know, maybe there's a lot happening in our lives um, related to that loss that we just might not even have the space for, for allowing these emotions to come out. Um, and that's okay. Sometimes they, they can't. Um, but other times we do need to find ways to address them and, and deal with them. So, you know, you'll see here on the side, I've got a little picture of a, of a house and, um, this is, is a metaphor I like to use when I talk about emotions. And so I'd love for you to kind of imagine this with me. So I want you to imagine you moved into a new house and, you know, it's your first day there and your neighbors are really friendly people. So what happens is the first day somebody comes over, rings your doorbell and they have brought you a cake and they've got this fantastic mood. They've got this bright smile on and you get this wonderful feeling when you're around them. So you, of course, invite them in for a coffee and, and you spend some time with them. And, you know, you're really enjoying your time, you know, talking with them and being with them. And they might at some point say, oh, you know, I got to go home. And, and maybe you even say to them like, really? You know, I just want you to stay here. I, I love being around you. I love how you make me feel. And they might say, you know what? Sorry, I've got to leave. So they, so they, they leave and you might still have that feeling of, oh yeah, this felt really good to have them around. And then the next day comes and, and you get another knock on your door and, and you run down the stairs because you're hoping it's that, that neighbor who made you feel so good and, and was really bright and happy. And you open the store and it's somebody totally new. And this person doesn't even have a cake and, and let alone like a smile on their face. And, and they look pretty down or, or they're kind of grumpy. And they're kind of like, oh, hi there. And, you know, they, they, they welcome you maybe to the neighborhood and, and they say to you, you know, oh, would you like to have a coffee? I'd, I'd love to come in. And you're, you don't feel very good around them. So you might say like, well, you know, I don't think so. I've got to go run some errands, you know, see you later. So you, you close the door. Now the next day comes and, and maybe you get another knock on your door. And it's that same grumpy, sad, or annoying person. And you, you kind of get a little bit annoyed and you say to them like, why are you back? I, I don't really want to be around you. I, I don't really like you coming over. And then you close the door again. 
And maybe after a while, this person keeps knocking on your door. And, and the more that they knock, the more annoyed that you get and the more frustrated you get. And after a while, they just keep coming. And, and now you're really frustrated that they, they keep coming over and you've told them that you don't want them to come over. Till finally one day you say, you know what? I'm so sick of this. I'm going to just sit down with this person and let them know I, how I feel. So you swing open the door and, and you welcome this person and you say, yeah, you know, let's go grab a coffee. You need to, to hear what you have to say. And, you know, so you sit down and, and they're not the nicest to be around. You don't feel the greatest around them. But then they start to tell you a little bit about themselves. And what starts to happen is you start to learn maybe why they're feeling that way. And sometimes they find, you find that, you know, you might realize that there's some reasons why they're coming over. And after a while, what you realize is, you know, they might say, you know, hey, thanks for the coffee. And then they go on their way. And you might see them once or twice, or maybe they come over every once in a while. But then you also get the happy person coming over again, or a different person coming over. And I really like to use this metaphor to think about how we deal with our emotions. So if you imagine those neighbors being our emotions, what we often do with uncomfortable feelings is we shut them out and we don't welcome them in for a coffee or sit with them. We try to get rid of them. And what I find a lot of times what that causes is this neighbor or this feeling to keep coming up. And the reason that happens is because our emotions are signals to us and, and they're important and they want to be listened to. And what can happen is we get really frustrated with them. So we almost start to do anything we can to not invite them in and listen to them or, or have them come over. Now, sometimes we have to shut the door, right? Sometimes we have to say no to a neighbor for coffee. But a lot of times what I find is that the more that we do that, the less that we learn about those feelings or learn about ways that they, what they're trying to signal to us. Okay. Yes. So I love all these comments that, um, you know, I get way more compliments now than I ever had in my life. I don't think any of us wanted to be a warrior, but here we are kind of like the term thrivers. Yeah. So someone else said, I've consoled friends as they didn't know how to handle what I went through. Wow. Hey, okay, yeah. Having to support someone who, who you're hoping probably supports you or, or trying to help you. Yeah. I hear that I'm resilient. The word used to annoy me because I felt like I was falling apart. Now I embrace it and get strength from it. Love it. Yeah. 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 There's, you know, sometimes these compliments or things people say to us are sometimes helpful, right? Sometimes we get those things that really support us or that term thrivers can help us feel like, you know, that, that really encompasses how we feel. Um, but other times they don't, right? Sometimes they don't make us feel that great or they kind of piss us off, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how do we bring emotions in? How do we sit down and have coffee with them really? Um, and really the way to do this is there's so many, so many ways to go about this. Um, and these are just six ways to, to do that. Um, and there, there's other ways that you might find that, that you do this. Sometimes that's just simply embracing them without judgment. So, you know, imagining that neighbor coming over and, and saying, oh, you're here again. And, you know, recognizing like, I don't feel great around you, but come on in, let's sit down. Naming them or identifying them can be very helpful. So sometimes it's even figuring out what word describes what you're feeling. And, and this works well with um, how our brains work. We love to know how to identify things. And so sometimes this can be comforting just to be able to label something and, and know what we're going through. The other ways to do this is to release it. So you might journal about it. You might do some art. You might do something that allows it to go through your body. Sometimes that looks really nice, like journaling and art. Sometimes that's like screaming in your car <laughs> or playing like really loud music that is that 
feeling for you. Um, so sometimes this doesn't look pretty and, and that's okay. Or, you know, I think sometimes I hear people say like, I had the worst ugly cry. And I always think, yeah, that's awesome because we need to release these feelings. Sometimes we do need to ground into the present moment. And, and I think I think it's the next slide that's going to teach you some ways to do that. And, and that's just essentially recognizing what's happening for me right now. What are the feelings? How's my body feeling? Okay. We also oftentimes need to nurture ourselves. So sometimes what I find is especially when we're we have an upcoming loss happening or we we are in a loss or we are grieving, is that takes a lot of energy. So sometimes we need to nourish ourselves almost like we're like an, you know, Olympic athlete or something. Um, you know, we need to make sure we're, we're eating, we get, you know, enough water, we're doing some sort of movement. Um, and, and there is a slide coming up here about compassion. And some of those are the ways to really show a lot of care and, and compassion to ourselves. The other way that is so helpful is sharing it with someone. And you know, I know you might have some people in your life that you can just be open and honest with, and they're just going to sit with you in those feelings. Um, or maybe you find someone who does that. So, you know, obviously I'm going to, you know, comment on being a therapist. Therapists are great for this. We're trained for it. Um, but sometimes it's a support group or even, you know, these webinars where you can chat back and forth with people who have gone through something similar. Okay. All right. Now, kind of mentioned self-compassion already, but really what self-compassion is, is showing kindness to ourselves. And this relates a lot to our emotions, because what I find a lot of the time is that we struggle with our emotions and we don't want to think about them or deal with them. And, and that's not necessarily kind. Sometimes we end up being very critical of ourselves. So we might be like, oh, like, why can't I get over this? Or why am I so frustrated about this? Or why can't I just, you know, go back to my normal self? And that really starts to create this idea that, um, you know, these emotions aren't welcome or these feelings aren't welcome and starts to create this struggle with, you know, our current experience. So, you know, self-compassion can be done in so many ways. One of my favorite questions that I always ask myself is how would you treat a friend or what would you say to a friend? And I'd love if people put in the chat there, maybe some ways or some comments that maybe they would have loved to hear from a friend or, or they would have loved to hear themselves going through a loss or maybe just things that you have said to people. Um, what I find a lot of times is we are not nearly as critical as, um, you know, as a, you know, other people are on other people as we are on ourselves. And when we start to think about treating ourselves as a friend, we often are a lot more kind. Okay. Now this is the slide on, on being in the present moment. And, and this is helpful, not only for recognizing our emotions, but also from, for, you know, staying in the moment, um, especially in an anticipatory grief where we're now in the present, we're grounded in what's happening right now and helps us redirect our focus onto what we can or, or can't control. And this, again, can be done in so many ways. Sometimes it is just directing our attention to this moment with maybe someone we, we really love who's going through you know, a, a terminal illness and just spending that really lovely minute with them holding their hand or maybe it's, you know, a little bit of joy when you sit outside and you watch a bee fly on a flower. There's so many times where we are caught up in either the past or even the future, you know, worrying about things going on or upset of, about the ways things have turned out. So one of my favorite ways to do this, and, and I like to think of this almost as securing your environment or securing your space. And I do this by just looking around and you're welcome to kind of do this with me, which is just looking around your space and, and looking for things that make you feel safe or comfortable. And this does twofold. It brings us into our environment, but it also helps us 
recognize things that that bring joy or 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 that feeling of safety for us so right now i you know i love that i've got some sunshine coming through um it's comfortable for me i'm, I'm kind of fiddling down here with a pen um you know i love that you know i'm able to have my water next to me um doesn't have to be much but sometimes these things help us feel a little bit more safe yeah, Rachel made a comment here that the best advice I had was to take time to heal and don't rush back to work until you're better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's such great advice to take that space. Okay, last little comment here, last little slide is that comment around gratitude versus this toxic positivity. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, and I hear this a lot that you should be grateful for being alive, or you should be grateful for, you know, something that's, that's happened, or you should be grateful that this surgery worked or, you know, whatever, whatever comment people make. And sometimes that really invalidates us. And I, I think someone put a comment here about feeling invalidated that I'll read out in a moment, but um, a lot of times that isn't really what gratitude is. Gratitude is, is centering on what's happening in a moment or recognizing maybe moments that we were grateful to have. So that's even saying, you know, I'm really grateful for this moment I'm sharing with my mom. You know, this is a really special moment for me. I'm really grateful that, um, you know, I'm able to get out of bed today or that I, you know, have my dog here to lay on my lap. Toxic positivity instead is this idea that you should only focus on the good. And this starts to create a really unhelpful cycle where suddenly we cannot think about the bad or think about the, you know, the, the thing that's causing us to feel grief. And it's this idea of, you know, only have good thoughts or good vibes only, or only, you know, notice things that make you feel good. Um, or, you know, you should be happy about this. And this often causes us to focus just solely on, uh, you know, the quote unquote good things, but really invalidates our own experience of, of what's going on. Okay, I think it was CJ here that said, I appreciated when people validated my issues by saying, this must be difficult for you. How can I help? Rather than saying, we all forget things, we all lose our keys, we are all angry. This made me mad because I had a brain injury from a, from a cranial autonomy is not the same as an average person who occasionally misplaces items or yells. Yes, CJ, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's not. Your experience is unique. And someone just telling you that other people lose keys doesn't, doesn't recognize your emotions in that moment, right? Yeah, we need to grant ourselves the grace we deserve. We often have this great advice and wisdom for our friends, but we need to be our own best friend. Yeah. Yes, people are commenting on, uh, 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 you know, just really recognizing and relating to what CJ says. Yeah. Or they say, must be nice not to have to work and still get paid. Yeah. Oh, that's a... <laughs> That one is, uh, yeah, doesn't also address what it's like to go through, you know, a, a, a loss or surgery or, yeah, some sort of illness, right? Yeah, yeah. I think grounding ourselves can be first going through a dark tunnel, unable to proceed at all for an undefined period of time. It is scary for us and, enc and encouraged, but needs to be accepted. Yeah, really accepting those feelings, yeah. Oh, I lied here. I'll go through this one real quick because I think I'm I'm tight on time, maybe. Um, you know, the last one is is recognizing ways to take care of yourself. And this one is is very unique to you. So you're gonna have a lot of different ways to do this. Um, this slide has a picture of of one of the bookmarks that that we have in our office that we give to people. And we kind of group it into different um you know, kind of categories. So we've got emotional, mental, physical, social, spiritual, and then, you know, uh, proactive where, you know, we are, are, you know, doing things that maybe touch on all, all of these things or gives you some ideas of how to do that. Okay. Yeah. Megan said, giving myself 
grace is so foreign to me. I've been really hard on myself all of my adult life. Yeah. You know, that self-compassion is so needed and, and so needed, especially with something as tricky and as devastating as, as grief and loss. Okay. So one last reminder here before I jump into the questions is that grief is unique and it's unique to the relationship you have. And that could be to someone else, to yourself or to, you know, whatever you are going through. And there's no right way to go about it. So you would have learned some tools from me, but there is not a handbook, a, you know, step-by-step process that you need to go through for with grief. Okay. Yeah. Rachel said, I found I had to limit my time with people who had toxic positivity 